Oh, we're really excited. My name is Mark Brigman. I'm with Partnernomics, and I'm joined here by uh, Brian Hathaway. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Brian for a long time and seeing the great work that he's doing. And a couple of years ago, we joined a, a collaboration. And so we pulled Brian into uh, into the partnerships world or deeper into it, uh, into this uh, into this space. And so we have some really exciting, really interesting, I think, information to share. But uh, Brian, if you don't mind, let's do a little bit while we're waiting for folks to join. We'll do a little bit of we'll kind of kill a minute or two sure. here and do some introductions and then we'll dive into the content. Yeah, no, that sounds great. And Mark, thanks for thanks for joining on with me and, and appreciate also the folks at uh, Cloud Software Association for hosting for us. Um, really glad to, to be able to be on here. Um, just to give a quick background for myself, I spent uh, about almost 13 years at Accenture um, and it was in the uh, uh, technology architecture group, uh, kind of specializing in enterprise architecture and, uh, and kind of a lot of technical stuff. Um, and then uh, left there and uh, started my own Salesforce.com consulting company. And so I've been uh, doing Salesforce.com implementation and also product development on the Salesforce platform. Um, and so we're coming up now almost on 19 years as a Salesforce partner in uh, one, in one capacity or another. And uh, it's been a really interesting journey. And so, uh, part of the uh, part of the engagement here, and part of the fun that uh, that we've got to have is, um, you know, I've, I've I've got to meet Mark and uh, help him out uh, with developing a product for him in the partnering space called Partnernomics. Uh, but in doing that, uh, we've also developed some other products around, in and around the space, and had some opportunities to pick up some learning about uh, the partnering space, the partnering ecosystem and want to just kind of talk about it from a technical architecture perspective, um, which isn't that common out there. I think a lot of people talk about partnering, but we don't really talk about the technology of partnering. And so I wanted to kind of bring a little bit of that flavor to things today. So uh, you know, thanks for having us on, and uh, hopefully that gives a little bit of an intro. And Mark, I'm going to throw it back to you. I'll have you do a little bit of an intro as well so that uh, everybody gets kind of an idea of you know, how both of us are, are kind of connected in this conversation. Sounds good. Well, I echo what uh, Brian had stated. Thank you to uh, CSA. We've enjoyed a great relationship for years uh, with Cloud Software Association. So I'm um, a big believer in, in the work that, that you guys are doing and just trying to advance uh, this world of partnership professionals uh, so we can do our do our thing better. But as Brian mentioned, so uh, we actually started Partnernomics. We kicked off the company in 2014. So we've been around for a while. And uh, the gosh, I guess probably the first Six years of our of our existence, six or seven years, was centered around building a methodology and doing mostly training, training, education, coaching, those sorts of things. And then, uh, as Brian mentioned, with his company's help, a couple of years ago, we uh, kicked off uh, an initiative that we had baked in the plan from day one, and that is put software underneath of uh, underneath of Partnernomics. And um, but what that's done over the last couple of years as we've dug deeper and deeper into this is it's really illuminated some challenges, but opportunities um, in this world of integrating. Right. We talk about, um, you know, the, the 2020s or this this era that we're in right now as being the decade of ecosystems. Well, to me, I kicked off my career at, with Sprint uh, in the late 90s making this crazy thing do all the stuff that it does today, you know, for 13 years, ran partnerships there. And so ecosystem just means networks of different partnerships. And this world that we live in on SaaS, software, technology, one of my uh, big passions, building that ecosystem is means you need to be able to connect. We always talk about building, making the easy button bigger. The, the, you know, whoever provides the biggest easy button for your client is the one that will win. And that's this perpetual, ever, everlasting, ever going game. But, you know, we're seeing, and the data is showing this, the larger easy button means how many uh, complementary solutions providers or how many other partners, piece, you know, pieces that are going into this recipe to build this, uh, this easy button. And at the center of that is integrations. 
And so let's go ahead and kick this off. Uh, Brad and I are going to kind of go through. We've got a little list of questions, but that will that will get us going. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and hold your questions or feel free to go ahead and toss them into uh, the chat. But what we're going to do is go through this content about 30 minutes or so to leave us hopefully plenty of time to really dig into any one of these particular areas that, that might be of interest for you. And so... Uh, Brian, you know, so the topic that we have here is growing partnerships through integrations. I guess, you know, by definition, if we're, you know, if we have some integrations that are out there with the other companies, that means that we are partnering. But what we want to do is do it efficiently and have it generate revenue at the end of the day. That's that's what we're in there to, to drive towards. And at the center of this conversation is around, you had already mentioned, a reference architecture. So let's kind of build this conversation from the ground up. What is a reference architecture? Yeah, thanks, Mark. And and yeah, we we've spent some time talking about this, and and I'll I'll kind of back it up by talking a little bit about um, what I did as an enterprise architect, um, you know, to be able to design systems. And <clears throat> when we were designing systems, we would be looking at you know functions in a business, right? You would talk about sales, marketing, right? You would talk about, you know, billing or revenue assurance or things like that. These are the, the functional areas that we talk about in business today. And so those words mean something. I'm in sales, I'm in marketing. But what we don't have is we don't have one of those key functional words for partnering. Right. So, you know, I don't say I'm in partnering. I say I'm on the partnerships team or I'm part of the sales group that does partnering. It's like partnering is kind of an afterthought. And as, as we've gone through this process and as we've tried to put systems into the ecosystems that we need to be able to set up, I've really come to appreciate the fact that there needs to be as much architecture, as much thought and as much energy going into designing proper partnerships as there is that goes into proper sales, proper marketing, proper billing, you know, any of these other major functions that you see in, in traditional business today. And, and so I wanted to be able to start putting some things out there to say, okay, you know, just as we go into a CRM and there is a, a very defined body of knowledge as far as what is a CRM, what is the theory behind a CRM, what are the standard business objects or the standard functions that are contained in a CRM? And I wanted to start uh, being able to put some of that stuff forward for what are the things that we need to consider when we're putting partnerships together? And there really needs to be something that, you know, right now, I think there's a lot of partnering professionals out there that are looking at an array of, of vendor offerings, vendor tools, and they're just trying to collect things together and, and cobble it together as best they can. But it's not an architected solution. It's kind of a haphazard collection of items. And so I wanted to, to be able to put forth some of the concepts that need to be part of the theory of partnering. And so that's really what we're trying to do here with putting a reference architecture in place is to say, these are the things that you need to have as a partnering professional in order to be able to make this thing work. And so as, as we're going forward here and we're gonna to continue to work on you know, promoting this idea, but putting this out there, we really wanted to put some things out there so that partnering professionals had something to look at and they had a way to be able to see if they are making good decisions about the tools that they're buying and the way that they're designing the overall infrastructure for what they're trying to accomplish. I think for partnering professionals, there's almost like kind of two lenses into this. One is as a practitioner, I need to make sure that my tech stack can work effectively to let me do my job correctly. Now, I think there's also, you know, from a solutions partnering perspective, which is where I spent a lot of my career at Sprint, is building these solutions, working with other companies to make sure that you have good, clean interoperability so that your solution performs. And so from those kind of two different seats at a minimum, uh, that's why this reference architecture is so important, and so critical. One of our growth strategies at Partnernomics is through Partnernomics IQ, the software that, that Brian had mentioned. 
And so we are looking to integrate with other complementary software packages, whether they're PRMs or their account mapping solutions, marketing systems, whatever it may be, we want to make that easy button bigger for clients. So we spent a lot of time over the last 12 to 18 months talking to other SaaS providers that we feel would be a good fit. And that's what's really kind of brought to light both the challenges and the opportunities centered around this very topic. So Brian, let's jump into this, uh, into the next question. What system should be the anchor point for partnership data and why? Yeah, and and really, and and you know, this is kind of the cornerstone of of setting the 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 foundation for what is your partnering system of choice, right? Because as as you start designing your partnering infrastructure, you want to figure out okay, you're going to have a, a a core or a central repository for all of that information, and. There's a lot of, and, and as as we've kind of been out into this uh, into this universe, there's a lot of software products that are out there that they all want to claim that they are the center of the universe for partnering activity. And as I was looking at that, I was I was trying to evaluate: Would I really want to do that? Would I want to put all of my partnering activity into a third party system? And the answer to that is no. Um, the 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 place that you should start and the foundation point for partnering should be in your CRM, and the the CRM already has all of your customer information in it. It has your sales processes. It has your sales motion in it, regardless of whether that sales motion is for direct channel or for you know a, 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 a consulting channel, whatever whatever partnership channel it is. Any of those things, um, all of that activity, all of your relationship data, all of your sales data, and all of your performance in the data and metrics are already in your CRM. And the CRMs today are pre predominantly able to uh, basically shift and morph so that you can accommodate different sales functions and different capabilities in them. So you need to be able to leverage that infrastructure in such a way that your CRM needs to be the focal point of all of your partnering activity, as well as all of your direct sales activity. So, you know, a lot of our clients use say PRMs or other systems, but let's say let's use PRMs as an example. So um, it's okay to use a PRM, right? For the function that it's designed for, but what you're saying uh, is that the data needs, you got to make sure that that data flows back uh, into your CRM and your CRM becomes that it is your your system of, of trust and truth, right? Within the organization, your finance department, your sales department, your CFO, they're used to running reports and they expect to be able to look at data inside of your CRM to get a visualization of what's going on in the business. And so it's not necessarily, or I guess this is kind of the question, you don't necessarily have to be working inside of your CRM. It is okay to use ancillary tools so long as that data comes back into the CRM. Is that accurate? Yeah, per yeah perfectly stated. Um, you know, there there are, you know, CRM is not meant to be the end-all be-all tool for everything. Um, and, you know, the CRM isn't, uh, if you talk to any of the CRM vendors, they, they would tell you there's things they're good at, there's things they're not good at. And so there are other tools that are out there in the partnering world that we certainly want to allow uh, them to do what they do best. You know, you know, Mark, you mentioned some of the, like there's account mapping tools, there's PRMs, there's, uh, you know, marketing tools, there's learning management tools. Those are things that are not necessarily in the wheelhouse of what CRM does. However, um, the, you can't ignore the fact that most of your sales data and most of your customer and relationship data is in your CRM. 
And so you need to be able to have the, the connectivity between your CRM and these third-party tools. And the central point and the central architecture point, and that, that was kind of what we were talking about in the reference architecture notion, is the, the, the hub of all this activity needs to be in the CRM because that's where the predominance of all of your core system information already lives. So I guess to companies that have built mm -hmm and are building software solutions for uh, this, this partnership system for practitioners, pro tip, <laughs> make sure that the data can flow into the CRM, right? Absolutely. There's a lot of systems, a lot of platforms that we have looked at, that we have investigated over the last 18 plus months. And more often than not, that architecture is incongruent. Yeah, and you know you're you're kind of uh, shading into a couple of the, the the next points that we want to to talk about because um, you know while I would tell you that your core data and and the crown jewel of your information repository of, of most corporate entities is the CRM and that usually the CRM ends up being that that first touch point or that first uh, engagement point that you have with the customer but it's really where, regardless of where you touch the customer first it's where you keep the relationship alive is in that CRM. And so you need to be able to have that as your as your core. But um, to your point, Mark, there's a lot of tools that are out there that don't have some other features that are necessary. And also, to be fair, um, CRM out of the box isn't necessarily tuned for partnership. And so there's a few things that we need to look at in terms of what do we need to change about partnering in a CR or what do we need to change in our CRM so that we can handle partnering on a more effective level? And so to be clear, I mean, your, your background, your business uh, is really focused on uh, Salesforce piece, but this, this applies globally across yeah, CRMs any, period. Any right? CRM. Cause again, it's, it's a CR, it's, CRM is a theory. Um, there are different tools that are out there. You know, there's Salesforce, there's Microsoft, there's HubSpot, and there's you know half a dozen others um, that are out there. And but they all operate in the same basic model, right? You have leads, you have accounts, you have contacts, and you have opportunities. And those are kind of the the core foundation points of any CRM. So um, you know this isn't a, a, a Thing where I'm trying to play favorites with any one particular tool, I'm, I'm specifically making sure that we're talking about CRM in general because that that is the repository for where your corporate information lives. And so let, let's go ahead and kind of, it's probably obvious, but let's double click on that, right? Because like as we work with hundreds of partnering professionals, different organizations across the world, <clears throat> predominantly 80% of our clients use Salesforce. They ask us, um, how can I make Salesforce work for my partnering program? How can I manage the operations of my partnering programs inside of Salesforce? And to the point that you made earlier, you can't do that out of the box uh, because it wasn't designed for that. <laughs> so we're right. kind of trying to take these CRMs and put them into a pretzel. But let's double click on that a little bit and, and kind of specifically call out why. Why can't a CRM be used to manage partnerships day one out of the box? So I'll, I'll go back to what I was just talking about, about CRM theory, right? You know, CRM theory says that I've got accounts, contacts, and opportunities at, at its core, right? But there's a couple of things that partnering needs that aren't in that out of the box standard set of CRM functions, right? And, and there's a couple of things that are critical for partnering professionals to be able to have that, that aren't part of that same thing that you would have as far as direct channel. And, th and those two things are, first of all, you have to have, you have to be able to have a distinction between what we call a partner and a partnership. And I'm gonna I'm gonna make the there's there's a distinction in those terms, and I want to be very clear about what I mean here. So uh, typically, a partner is going to reference 
an account or a company that we are setting up an arrangement with. And so if I have a partner, that is going to be somebody who I am going to be uh, setting up an arrangement with. But in, in today's environment and what we're seeing is partnering professionals aren't that simple. They are making more complicated deals. They're engaging with their partners at a deeper level. And there are different ways that they can engage with any one particular partner. And so if, for example, if I have a partner that I do some resale work with, and I take that same partner and I do co-sell work with them. Well, I may have two different partnering agreements with them. I compensate you X for a resale, but I compensate you Y for a co-sell. And in that regard, I need to be able to not only track who is the partner, but I also need to track what partnership I was using in order to be engaging on that deal. And so that's a very fundamental change or a very fundamental uh, difference in the way that we track engagement. Um, you know, if I'm talking about direct channel, I set up an opportunity because that opportunity represents a direct one to one relationship with the customer. But if I'm doing something with a partner, now I need to know does that partner bring me that customer via a co sell or a resell? And so if that's happening, I need to be able to understand the difference between who is my partner, but who is the partnership. But what is the partnership that I'm using? What's that model that I'm using to be able to close that deal? So that's one difference that uh, you know where out of the box uh, CRM doesn't cut it, and you need to be able to make an architectural change so that you can put that information and have that information available. Uh, Brian, I want to hit that one again because we we see that a lot. And what I'm going to specifically is attribution to the partnership. And so as you look at these different software solutions that you're wanting to put into your tech stack to help manage partnerships, uh, if the attribution just comes into a big bucket uh, and you have multiple partnerships, say a resale, uh, a, a referral, maybe an affiliate over here, maybe a tech integration partnership there, you actually need to be able to separate those so that you can track the effectiveness and track the, the money, the cause and the effect uh, appropriately. If you could have a, a large organization, a partner, a large partner, and have two or three uh, partnerships with them, you may, you may have a referral partnership that's very healthy. Uh, hitting on all cylinders, hitting the goals, life is good. But on a co-sell or a resell or um, an MSP lane, some other partnership type, it may be underperforming. And so it's absolutely critical to be able to separate all of this data so that you have health metrics by partnership, not by partner. So I don't know if we've beat that one to death, but this is critical. And this is one area it's, that as a partnering profession, um, we are currently wrong uh, in most cases, and it needs to be it needs to be fixed so that we can evolve uh, to the level and the capabilities that's possible. Yeah. And, and Mark, in, in that discussion that you hit, you hit, you happen to touch on the second uh, key feature of CRM that isn't correct out of the box and it's something that needs to be added in, right? And, and you mentioned the notion of attribution. And, you know, so uh, while we talk about the difference between partner and partnership, um, we also can have deals. And again, we're, you know, partnering professionals are getting more and more creative and more and more capable in terms of the types of deals that they're pursuing. And so as that happens, we're also diversifying the portfolio of partnerships. And I'm being very deliberate with my words here. The number of partnerships that can be involved in a deal. 
Um, you know, there are some very complex products out there where we can have three or four different companies that are playing in the deal in order to, to, to be able to complete it. And so not only do we need to be able to, to have an architectural distinction between partner and partnership, but we also need to be able to handle many to one in terms of the number of partnerships that are involved in a deal. And so those two aspects of partnering in general, and, and, and again, I'm being very broad with the way that I'm talking about this because this isn't anything, this is something that, that is fundamental to the structure of how partnering is engaged with everyone who is involved in this profession. You're gonna have multiple players involved in a deal and you're gonna have multiple partnership types that are involved from different companies. And, and so Mark, to your point, to be able to, to evaluate the effectiveness, the capability and, and the performance of a particular partnership, and again, I'm being very deliberate with my words, there has to be the ability to have that distinction in the architecture of the systems that you've built so that you can make all of this stuff available and easy to evaluate. Awesome. Let's move on to the to the next topic, and that is around APIs, right? So we talked about uh, integrations. That's that's part of the title here. And so kind of moving into this decade of ecosystems, companies, SaaS companies that are open for integrations are expected to have APIs. <laughs> the question is, um, are all APIs created equal? What what do we need to do? Whenever we dig a little bit deeper under the hood with APIs, what do we need to know? What do we need to know? Yeah, and and great question. And and again, I, I'm glad we got the chance to talk about the two distinctions of how you need to understand a partnering program, right? To be able to understand multiple attributions and partner versus partnership in terms of, of the capabilities, because that type of nuance in the data is also something that you need to have when you're talking to other systems. Um, and so we, and this is one of the things that as we've started to reach out and try to connect to other systems using APIs, we're finding out there's there's two parts to an API. There's first part is just the technical part. Can we connect, right? And is there ability to, to transfer data? And um, in most cases and in most systems today, you know, everybody's got a modern API that they can talk back and forth. And so from that standpoint, from the technical ability, can we do an API um, that, it, you know, for modern systems today, yeah, you can do APIs. And if there's a system out there that can't do APIs, you probably ought to not be talking to them because that's just that's just table stakes uh, for being able to, to be in this connected world of partnerships. The, the bigger challenge comes in, in in really saying, what is the information that you're exchanging over that API, right? What's the language that we're speaking? And one of the things that we're finding, and, and this is the one thing that, that really made me want to put this reference architecture notion out there, is the fact that as, as we're connecting and we're talking to third-party tools, those third-party tools aren't capable of providing the nuanced information that we want to have. So if I have a PRM, do I have a PRM that can track multiple attributions on a deal? Do I have a PRM that can track different partnership models? And again, being just deliberate with my words, the, a lot of the PRMs, a lot of the account mappers out there, and you even hear it in the term, if I'm doing an account mapping, that's all I'm doing is account mapping. I'm not able to attribute these things down to the partnership level. I can just say, hey, we're connected and there's some there's some common overlaps in our accounts, but I don't know why I would want to talk to a particular partner. Is it because I have an affiliate relationship or is it because we have a resale relationship that we want to explore with these particular channel partnerships? And so those are the things that uh, we want to make sure that we have those capabilities that are part of the API and it, it, this is really, it becomes a data modeling question as to do we have the right data that we can exchange between these partners? 
And then just the last piece on uh, just the, the API part is I like to just kind of call out unidirectional versus bidirectional. And as, as you think about the strategy for either your solution that you're taking to market um, or even solutions that's that's in your tech stack that you're using for managing partnerships, what's the difference between unidirectional, bidirectional, and what's the advantage of, of having bidirectional if we can, if it, the system allows for that? Yeah, and and also that's that's got to be part of again. There's got to be table stakes, you know. As, as we talked about at the beginning, um, where we talked about being able to communicate back and forth between a CRM and these third party tools that we would bring up, we certainly want to use these three part, third party tools in order to be able to handle functions that they're good at, and and we certainly want to allow that anytime. But that conversation between you know, your CRM and those third-party tools has to be two-way because you need to be able to send data from your tool to the third party and the third party needs to be able to send data back to you. And so there has to be two-way conversation um, that, that's set up in there. And one of the things that we're seeing, and I'm gonna call this out specifically is as we work with account mapping tools, the account mappers are one way. Right, they take all the data out of your CRM, and if you want it back, you have to look at it. You can't actually download it into your CRM unless you. I think you can get a premier membership, but most people don't. But the the point of that is is that um, if you want to really have effective uh, control of how you're managing your partnering, you need to be able to have it so that it's automated, and by creating something that has a one way interface in it it basically creates technical debt. It's where your people have to make up for the, the failings of an automation. And, and that's really not what we're about here, especially as, as partnering professionals. We want this thing to work well. And, and so that's why we want to design it so that it works well. Awesome. Uh, well, I've got 32 minutes after, so I think we're about right on track. So let's yeah. go ahead and... Uh, kind of shut that down there and open it up for questions. Feel free to toss it into the chat. Love to see if there's any questions or, you know, some some constructive feedback. Maybe people have different backgrounds, different interests, experiences that they would like to share, um, you know, regarding the reference architecture or successes, additional challenges that they have had um, in, in, this, in this space regarding these topics. Yeah. Mark, I'm going to throw as we're waiting for questions to come in. I'm going to I'm going to do a little bit of an ad, ad lib um, just to to talk about this in general, right? Um, it, as we talk about the success of, of a, a reference architecture, the success of a design program, because you want to be able to be considered and deliver it with how you're setting up everything, and so. The the question that I always get asked uh, when we're evaluating CRM is, is my CRM set up right? And, and I would extend this question to, is my partnership program set up right? And I have a one question diagnostic. And that question is, how do you do your reports? And if the answer comes back, I'm using my CRM native tool set reporting that tells me that I'm getting all of my data out because all my data is located in one place and it's properly organized so that I can do standard reporting and I've got everything I want at my, at my fingertips. If the answer comes out, oh yeah, I'm collecting a bunch of data from a bunch of different sources and I'm downloading it from my, uh, my data warehouses, I'm downloading it from three other tools and then I'm mashing it all together in Excel and in order to do a partner business review or a corporate account review, it takes me three days of accounting to be able to put that together. That is not going to be a successful implementation. And so the reason we're promoting all of this is as far as being able to work within your CRM and to do that is to be able to put all of that information together in a single place that you can be successful with your reporting and you have instant availability to metrics and performance. So that was my that was my big soapbox moment, but that's really it's the question to ask, which is 
how do you do your reports? And if you're spending, if you're spending hours in Excel, you need to rethink. Yeah. Such a, such a true point there. And uh, it's, that's a common theme with partnering professionals as they're looking to now use Partnernomics IQ is they spend hours, if not days preparing for the big uh, quarter end business reviews or however they're doing those both internally and externally. (laughs) Great point. If you're using Excel and, doing all these pivot tables and uh, V lookups and, you know, putting it into a, into a pretzel and there's a better way. <laughs> there's gotta be a better way. Um, okay. So it looks like we've asked a few times for questions. I don't see any there. So um, I just like to encourage people. Uh, if you're not connected with Brian or myself, please uh, jump out on LinkedIn, connect with us. Uh, maybe you, you know, have a question that you'd want to follow up with then. Happy to continue this conversation. And uh, Brian has put out a blog series. He just launched it uh, a couple weeks ago, but he's going to be laying out, you know, over the series, a reference architecture. So be sure to check that out. Go connect with him on LinkedIn and and follow the reference architecture and uh, play into the conversation. Put in some comments and uh, let's do this together. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Everybody have a great day. Thank you for your time. And thanks again to Cloud Software Association for having us on. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone.